don't have to do it aloud. You can do it quietly. You can think it, say it to him on your own.
Aren't you thankful for hindsight or for being able to look back and realize how it all turned out? I'm, I've been thinking so many times today at various, just random times. This morning I got up at 530, so it was still dark. And I'm thinking, you know, what was going on at that point? And I'm thinking he's being railroaded by the, the Jewish leaders at that time. And then around noon, I'm thinking this is when he you know, was nailed to the cross. And then about four o'clock, and I'm thinking, well, he's down, he's buried, he's in the tomb. What are his followers thinking? And I'm just thinking, what must it have been like to, been, to have been there, going through that for the first time, not having the value of hindsight? The songs we sang, I mean, they have the awareness that there is victory and that it didn't stay, he didn't stay dead. It, and it's impossible for us to put ourselves exactly in the place of those who went through it at the time. But, but I think it's important, especially because most of you have heard this story dozens of times. I think it's important that we do something to try to break through, as we started to talk about last week, break through the monotony, break through the, the apathy that has to come when you've heard a story 60 times or more. And... And so that's, that's kind of what I want to hope that we can do this week. I started last week to talk about how we're looking at the events of this week, what we call Holy Week, through the lens of kind of an epic story, a story that God is writing, and we get to sort of be in on it. Every good epic story has at least three elements. One is it has a villain. It has a bad guy. It has an antagonist. Somebody who is messing things up. It has, it has somebody in need of rescue, a victim, a hostage, an innocent bystander who gets caught up in things. And it has a hero, has somebody who's willing to say, I'm not going to let this continue. I'm going to put myself on the line. I'm going to step in and I'm going to take care of things. I'm going to make a difference. Well, this epic story... You know, when I use the word story, I realize that instantly you go to fiction. You go to this nice fluffy... St- this, in, this spec, in this aspect, we understand that this epic story is not just a story. This is true. This is based on historical fact. And therefore, the themes that we can learn from, the themes that we so easily get attracted to in other stories are things that can resonate deeply within our hearts. And so it certainly had all of the elements. There was, of course, the bad guy, the villain. He was Satan, the devil, Lucifer, the father of lies, the murderer from the beginning, the thief. Jesus said that he came to steal and kill and destroy, and he's been very effective at it from day one, and he's still very effective at it. He came between God and mankind literally from the beginning, from virtually the first day of mankind's existence, Satan stepped in and, and deceived and ran interference and, and started to destroy what God was doing. And mankind kind of went along with it. So then you have humanity, you and I and every human on the earth since that point, as victims, as the hostages, if you will, in need of a rescue. It, We're hostages and victims in the sense that the devil deceived us and deceived our ancestors and lied to us and got us to disobey God. And we actually have said no to God from the time of our first ancestors right up until today. This has led us, of course, into sin. And sin is a huge problem (laughs) because God is perfectly holy perfectly righteous, perfectly pure, and will not put up with sin, will not allow sin in his presence. 1 John 1, 5 says, This is the message we heard from the beginning and declare to you. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. Other scriptures say, God will not, you will not look on sin. You will not allow sin in your presence. See, the problem is we are not light like he is. In fact, if anything, at our core, at our heart of hearts, we're darkness. In ourselves. As the scriptures say in Isaiah 64, you have been angry with us, for we are not godly. We are constant sinners. How can people like us be saved? We are all infected and impure with sin. When we display our righteous deeds, they're like nothing but filthy rags. They are like autumn leaves. We will wither and fall, and our sins sweep us away like the wind. Jeremiah 17:9 says, The heart is deceitful and wicked beyond cure. 
deceitful above all things, and wicked beyond cure. Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned, all have fallen short of the glory of God. I mean, this is the human condition, the way it is right now. And so, in one sense, we are the victim of a deceiver, and we need rescue, but in another sense, we are fully culpable for our own sin and totally responsible and that leaves us in a really bad position. This is bad news because what that tells us is we are cut off from God's blessings, God's forgiveness, and the love and the life that he wanted to show us. And if left to ourselves, if left right there, we'd be stuck right there forever, without hope, separated from God forever. Now, there is good news in the story, too. Clearly, we've been singing about good news as well. So there's, story, there's good news, but the, the thing is, we have to own the bad news first. And so often, we want to get rid of the bad news. We want to uh, qu quickly get beyond the bad news. Just quit talking about the sin stuff. But if we don't really own that, if we're not gripped by it, then the good news doesn't really hold that much promise to us. I remember having a conversation with somebody uh, several years ago, and she said, Dave, I understand what you're saying, but you can't tell people that they're sinners and expect them to hang around and listen more. And here's the deal. <laughs> if you don't know you're a sinner, then none of this really matters. Because if you don't think you're a sinner, if you think sin is about other people or sin is about some really bad guy, some mass murderer, but you're not a sinner. If you don't understand that sin is in you, then all of this talk about Savior really doesn't mean anything. That's why Jesus as the hero had such an important mission to accomplish. And this is the why. This is the why that you and I need to know. We need to grasp this. And especially if you've been hearing it for 50 years or 40 years or 30 years or 60 years or however many years, if you've been hearing it that long, I know it has a tendency to just kind of grow crusty and old. I know it. You have to somehow push beyond that and let the Holy Spirit sensitize you again to show that, yes, this is about you. Without this hope, you would be stuck. You would be condemned. You would be on the outside. And that is the why that we need to know and appreciate these events so much. Jesus had a mission, and his mission was your rescue and your deliverance and your salvation. And if he didn't fulfill his mission, like we're talking about today, we would be in real big trouble. Now, it was not a primarily physical salvation or rescue that they needed. The people of Israel thought that's what they needed. That's what they wanted. They wanted somebody to come physically as a political ruler and free them from Rome and let them have free and independent Israel and not bother them more than that. In other words, they didn't really want to change there's nothing I need to change. I'm a good Jew. Just let me be free from Rome and everything will be fine. And so if he would have come along and said, I'm your political leader, we will throw off Rome and we will just, you know, I won't mess with you. They would have said, great. They would have welcomed that. That's what they were looking for. They didn't realize they needed a spiritual rescue. They were looking for circumstantial change in politics and in, in who governs us. They didn't realize they, they needed change deep down in their hearts, change within. They didn't need a change in their circumstances, but in their hearts. So they had sinned. They were sinners just like we are, just like you and I. And therefore, they, even though they were good Jews, they were separated from God, and that was the first change that needed to happen. Their separation, this separation was serious. God took it seriously. See, since God would not allow sin in his presence, somebody needed to step in and pay. Somebody needed to step in and make it better and pay the debt. And that's why from the beginning, God set up a sacrificial system, which you and I can't really relate to, but he set it up because it was that important. He set up an animal sacrifice system so that the Jews, knowing the law, could sacrifice an animal to pay for their sin. And so they might sacrifice a pigeon or a lamb or a goat, or a bull, or whatever it was, depending on the, the kind of sacrifice that they were doing, and whether it was their community, or whether it was their family, or whatever. But that was happening all the time in the temple, all the time, because sin was a real thing, a common thing. And so it had to be costly. 
God set up a sacrificial system because it had to be costly. Without the shedding of blood, we read in Hebrews, there is no tr forgiveness of sins. There had to be a sacrificial system. And God put it that way because he wanted them to know this is huge. This wall between us is huge, and you can't just sweep it under the rug and hope it goes away. There ha somebody has to pay. Something has to pay. And so he set up the system for, their, for them to continually come and confess their sin and be cleansed by this thing. But it was really a foreshadow, which is another thing that you see in some good epic stories. That is something, some element that happens, and you go, I think that's going to come back later. And sure enough... It was. The sacrificial system was a foreshadow of the perfect sacrifice that would come later. And that perfect sacrifice was, of course, Jesus. There was this wall of separation between God and humanity that needed to be destroyed, but none of them at that time, and none of us at this time, were qualified to destroy it. They couldn't do anything because they were some of the ones who needed the deliverance. They were the ones who needed Forgiveness, And so they couldn't earn forgiveness by themselves. However, Jesus was the one that was qualified. Jesus was the only one who was qualified as fully God in the flesh. Remember, we talked about the word Emmanuel that we, we mentioned at Christmas time. I mentioned it last Sunday. Emmanuel, God in the flesh, God with us. Jesus came to earth as God in the flesh to live as a human being. So he was fully God, but he was also fully man. And in some way, <laughs> that worked. And so he was both. He could relate to our temptation. He could relate to our vulnerability, but he never sinned. And so as a result, he was the only one ever in history qualified to rescue us. He had a mission, but it wasn't a mission impossible. It was a mission impossible for everybody else. It wasn't a mission impossible for him. It was exactly what he came to do. However, this rescue would be different. A lot of times you think of a rescue story, you think of the hero sweeping in, and at just the right moment, they gather up the, the damsel in distress, and they, they swing away, and they get out of the bad guy's um, influence or, or space. Or, or the guy who comes in and just at the very last moment vanquishes the enemy and rescues the damsel or rescues the, the innocent person or whatever. This one would be different. And again, this isn't just a Disney story. This is a real circumstance, real events. In this one, the hero actually dies for the victim. In this one, the hero willingly dies for the victim. This is a different kind of a rescue story. Now, Jesus would win and would pay our debt, but he would do it by laying down his own life for us. And that would lead, of course, to the surprise plot twist that I talked about last week that we're still looking forward to. John the Baptist called him the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus was the only one who could do it in history, ever. And so, yeah, so when you talk to people who don't believe and they say, how can you believe that? How could that have ever happened? Well, it happened once. It will never happen again. And it was a unique situation. You're right. It's very strange, very unusual, very unique, very miraculous, but it happened. The writers of Scripture came to understand this. He had no sin of his own to pay, and they said it this way. Peter said, he committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. John wrote that everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But he, you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins, and in him was no sin. Paul wrote, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So Jesus was the one and the only ever with no sin to pay for him of his own. And that's why he could pay for yours. And that's why he could pay for mine. In fact, when the time came, honestly, it was, it was a mission that he was called to. He understood it. He understood the plan. He knew it. Peter tried to talk him out of it and say, let's not go up to Jerusalem. Let's not give, your, give, you, give you to them. And he said, get behind me, Satan. You're looking at things the way man looks at. I'm looking at things the way God looks at it. I understand the plan. Jesus understood the plan. He knew it, and yet he still had to overcome humanity, his own humanity, to fulfill it. He struggled as he prepared, but he knew he had to continue. That's why he was there. John 12, 27 and 28, he says, Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. 
It was for this very reason that I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Jesus had to overcome his own natural human self-preservation instinct, and it was hard. It was not just a, he was not a robot. He it wasn't just programmed, okay, this is your divine responsibility, go do it, no sweat off your brow. No, this was difficult. It was a struggle. Luke 22 says it. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them. He knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed all the more earnestly. And his sweat was like drops of blood falling on the ground. Not my will, but yours be done. That had to be a struggle for him. We tend to think, well, he's God. I mean, it's easy. No, it was hard. He knew what he would go through. He went forward and he allowed himself to be arrested and tried and sentenced. He mounted no self-defense. They marveled that he wasn't trying to defend himself. But think about it. If he knew this was the goal, if he knew this was his mission, if, they knew, if he knew this is why he came, why would he try to get out of it? He didn't want to get out of it. He knew that was his responsibility. He didn't call angels to come and rescue him. Because he knew his mission. He knew his call. This was the will of God. Laid out before the world even began. So that mankind could be restored and have a relationship with their creator again. If the wall of separation was to be destroyed, it had to be Jesus who would destroy it. But he would have to do it utterly alone. Nobody could go with him or help him. His friends, in fact, would desert him. And they would even be separated from his father for a brief time. Matthew 26 says it this way. He told them, this very night you will fall away on account of me. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the, sh and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. And of course, some of them tried to protest, I'll never leave you. Peter tried to protest, no, I'll never, I'll never deny you, Lord. And he says, Peter, tonight before the rooster crows, you're going to deny three times that you even know me. And then just a few verses later in that same chapter, when, when, it, when the enemies are coming to the garden to take him and arrest him, it says, in that hour, Jesus said to the crowd, am I leading a rebellion that you come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I sat with you in the temple courts teaching and you didn't arrest me. But all of this has taken place so that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. And then all the disciples left him and fled. All of his closest friends boogied. They're out of there. He's alone. Say alone. You've got to understand that. Jesus stood there willing to take it alone for you. You've got to get that. After Jesus had been arrested, he was brought before the Jewish council in a rigged trial. And then he was handed over to the Gentiles. The Jews, the Jewish leaders, handed him to the Gentiles. This was scandalous. They hated the Gentiles. They hated the fact that Rome ruled over them. They could not stand it. And yet they handed another Jew, a fellow Jew, over to these Gentiles. And then they demanded that these Gentiles crucify him. This was unheard of. Now, the Romans, for their part, Pilate in particular, he didn't really care about Jewish religious squabbles. He wouldn't have got, wanted to get involved in that. He's like, you deal with your own stuff. And he really didn't care about an individual Jew, for that matter. If he lives or dies, what's it to me, right? But ha Pilate had something going on in him, and Jesus, he knew, was innocent. And he tried, actually, to set Jesus free, but he was also intimidated by the crowd. And the Jews kind of stirred up the crowd, and a riot started to form. And so he washed his hands and said, okay... I bear no responsibility for this man. Take him, crucify him. Once that sentence was pronounced, he was handed over to the soldiers and they mocked him, they beat him, they whipped him with his cat of nine tails that tore flesh out of his back. They forced a crown of thorns on his head. They spat upon him. I mean, it was brutal. And then they made him carry his own cross to his death. So with all of these things happening, one of the things I was thinking about today was, I wonder what his followers were thinking. I mean, seriously. Try to go back. How, they had to be thinking, how can this be happening? Jesus did everything, literally everything right and nothing wrong. How could this be happening? Has God forgotten? Has God lost control? 
No, he hasn't. He hadn't. And when the time came for him to be crucified, a brutal, painful death, normally reserved for notorious criminals, the worst of criminals, or the people Rome really wanted to make an example for, he, Jesus, willingly went forward and took that. And as he said, had said to his disciples, the reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. At that moment, I'm sure Pilate thought he was taking it. The Roman soldiers thought they were taking his life from him. The Jewish leaders thought, yes, we're taking his life from him. Jesus is saying, no, none of that is happening. I'm laying my, down, I'm laying my life down of my own accord. I have the authority to do that, and I can take it up again. This is the command I received from my Father. This is my mission. This is my task. He knew that he was fulfilling that mission that he'd come to fulfill to secure our rescue and our salvation through his willing self-sacrifice. And as he did it, he marched on and he finished it. And then when they reached Golgotha, the place where they crucify people outside the city, they nailed him to the cross, hoisted him up, and, pff, and, he, and he, he stood there on the cross, hung there. And sometimes that brutal form of death took days of torture. But this time he had already been almost killed by, beforehand, and so it didn't take that long. As he was nailed to the cross and dying, I'm sure the only consolation that he had was knowing that he was fulfilling the mission that God had given him. He was fulfilling the task so that man, it could all turn around. He was rescuing us. But it was brutal. It had to, you have to understand, it had to have been brutal for him. Matthew 27, from noon to about three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was utterly alone for the first time in history with all of the weight of the sin of the world placed on his shoulders, just lay, just on his shoulders. Your sin, my sin, the sin of all the world on him, he had to take it, and he had to take it and suffer for it alone. The innocent hero stepping in to pay for the guilty. Here's one of the amazing things you and I have to realize if we're going to get this story. If we're going to get the epic nature of this thing. Even here, even on the cross, at the very moment where he was going to die, God was in control. And Jesus knew that this, what was going on, and Jesus willingly submitted to the eternal plan. John 19, 28 says, Later, knowing that everything had now been finished, and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. And a jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it. They put it on a, the sponge on a, a stalk of a hyssop plant, and they lifted it to his lips. And when he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Luke records it just a little bit differently. He says, the curtain, he says, points out, the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And when he had said this, he breathed his last. Others, other of the apostles say he, he cried out in a loud voice, and they don't tell you what he cried out. I believe all of these things were things he said at the very last moment. These are slightly different perspectives, but when you put them all together, you see Jesus utterly alone with the weight of the sins of the world upon his shoulders, and he did what he came to do. He paid for the sins of mankind. He paid for your sins, and he paid for my sins. All of them. A couple of the phrases deserve a little bit of focus. It is finished. Say, it is finished. It is finished. Meaning, all is paid. There is no more payment for your sin. This is an amazing thing. I mean, think about it. How many of you have ever had a mortgage? Car loan? Credit card? Debt? Student loan? How many of you have ever paid any of those off? Do you ever mail extra checks to the bank just for old time's sake? <laughs> Do you ever say, you know what, I got, I got into a routine. I think the bank deserves at least one more just because they were good sports. No. What do you do? You celebrate that the fact that the debt is paid. You, you live in the freedom of that debt is gone. That debt that you had, that I had, our sin has been paid for. It, there's no more payment. And so you don't need to take that upon yourself. No matter what the enemy tries to whisper in your ear, it's finished. It's paid for. 
He paid for it once for all. Another phrase where it says the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Matthew actually says, and I think Mark does too, that it was torn in two from top to bottom. That's a pretty important detail if you don't know that. The temple had several different parts. The inner part, the most holy place, was the place where the Ark of the Covenant was. And the high priest would go in there once a year to perform a sacrifice for himself and for the people with him. In fact, some traditions say that they tied a rope around the high priest because when he went in there, if he died, they had to pull him out rather than go in there because it was so restricted. Access to that part was only for the high priest and only on certain days, period. Anybody else went in there, they'd be struck dead. That's how firm this was. There was a curtain that held, that separated this part from the next part out which was a little bit more accessible. And then there was another section that was even more accessible. But this was the point where the high priest goes in there and that's the curtain that was torn from top to bottom when he said it is finished. And so I believe it's almost like God himself tore that curtain. God took his hands and said, rip, now there's access. Now, through Jesus, you have access to me. Through Jesus, we have access to the throne in such a way that only the high priest could before. Communicates that you can go to the Father in heaven. Hebrews 7 says it this way. Such a high priest truly meets our need. One who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priests, he doesn't need to offer sacrifices day after day first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed their sins once for all. Say once for all. Once for all, all, he sacrificed for your sins. This story is true. This epic story is not just some great movie somewhere. This is a true story. Jesus came as God in the flesh to rescue mankind from the adversary, Satan, who always wants to destroy us, always wants to get in between us and God and keep us separated. We needed rescuing because by ourselves we couldn't do it. But it was, you know what? It was actually more than that. It was more than a rescue story, as good as that would be. It had to be more. It had to also be a redemption story. See, we, the victims in this story, we're not innocent victims after all. We were sinners. We had turned our backs on God and said no to God's leadership. We had gone our own way at every turn. See, the point was that now our nature had become so opposed to God that it was in our nature to sin. It was in our nature to say no to God's leadership. So if Jesus defeated Satan on our behalf but then left us as we were, we would still be separated from God because we would just start sinning again, right? Even if we came to understand it and and just slay this wipe clean, now we're just going to fill it up with more sin because it, it was in our nature. Something needed to change inside. We'd be on the outside looking in still if if that was all it was. It was only because of what Jesus had done for us that He had atoned for, He had paid for that sin, and now He offers us life. And we'll hear about that, of course, on Sunday. But our debt, the debt that you owe, the sin that you owed, that was way too costly for you to pay off. That has been paid off. It's as if Jesus was stepping in to pay our debt marked paid in full. And your debt is now paid in full. And where, where there is no more debt, you can live free. You can live joyously. You can live enthusiastically. And that's part of the full life that he wants to introduce you to. And that's why we talk so much about it around here. So the hero, the rescuer, did what he came to do. He paid off our debt. He paid it in full, and he gives us life. But the story wasn't over. In fact, the villain, I mean, think about it. At that moment, we know because we have hindsight, and we can look back 2,000 years. At that moment, the villain thought he had won. It looked like he had. Jesus was dead and buried in the tomb. That's as complete as you can get at that point. His followers thought they had lost and Jesus had been defeated. This, this was, in their minds, a terrible defeat. And that moment, at, at this, this very hour, all those years ago, they were in utter despair. 
They were huddling together, afraid of the Jews, and not knowing, I mean, I, they probably couldn't even speak. They were so despondent. Because that's what it seemed like. All hope was lost. Their leader, their rabbi, their friend, their savior, or the one they thought was their savior, was crucified, died, buried, gone. It doesn't get much worse than that. However, we know that was not the end. The plot twist was still to come. They thought it was utterly dark, but there was a glimmer of hope that they couldn't see through all their tears. The epic, true story seems really dark at this moment in their existence. But we all need to stay tuned and to hang on. It's not over. It's still being written, and Sunday is coming. So let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you that you sent Jesus to pay for our sin. We did not deserve that. He went to a cross, a cross, an instrument of brutal torture and death. And he did it willingly. He did it knowing that was his mission. His job, his goal was to pay for our sin. A righteous one stepping in and paying for us. Thank you that he did that. Thank you, obviously, is a lame response. But it's all we can do is thank you and praise you and, and give you and respond to you by giving you our lives. And so I pray, Father, that you would help us to do that today and every day. And Father, as we think of what they were going through all those years again, help us to to feel it. Help us to own it, the darkness within ourselves, so that we can then receive and celebrate the freedom that comes when our debt is paid by Jesus. I thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, one of the ways it seems very appropriate that we would celebrate and observe this today would be to share in communion. Because remember, <laughs> This was Friday, the night before this, Jesus was celebrating the last Passover with his disciples. And he was celebrating this, and what they had always done was look back in their history. Thousands of years to Moses and the Passover and everything, and they had celebrated that, and, and rightfully so. But now Jesus was implementing something new. And we read about it in 1 Corinthians 11. It says, literally, on the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. And then he broke it in pieces and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In other words, don't just do this in remembrance of ancient history where we had to run, leave with bread without yeast. This is now representing my body. After, in the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is now the new covenant between God and his people and, and an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this to remember me as often as you drink it. Again, don't just look back and look at the blood of the Passover lamb. Remember that I am the Passover lamb. I am the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. I am the lamb of God who causes God to pass over your sin and my sin. And Jesus says, now remember me when you do this. And so Paul writes, as often as you do it, you, pr you pr proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. And that's why it's so important that we do it. We've got to remind ourselves what he did on that cross and why it makes a difference to us. And so, yes, it's a religious ritual that we come and we do every month. But I encourage you to, man, let it, let it be more than that. Take, when you come up, take the little cup, take the little piece of cracker and take it back and do business with God. If you've forgotten, if you've gotten kind of apathetic about it, ask him to renew you. Ask him to revive you. Ask him to remind you where you've come. Ask him. If, if you've never done it, this is the perfect time to do it. Say, Lord, I never understood it before. I never realized it was my sin, me, that you paid for. And worship him as a result. And then when you're ready, you take the bread and you take the cup and you remember that his body and blood paid for your sin. And now you can have freedom. And that's a beautiful thing. So as the band plays, I encourage you to come up and take the cup and the cracker and then go back to your seat, pray, thank God again, and then take the elements when you can, okay?
amazing that the cross, which was an instrument of torture and death and defeat, has now for Christians become an emblem of victory. It's become an emblem that symbolizes life. It's an instrument of death that now symbolizes life because we get to look back and we know what Jesus did and what he did later. The thing that is coming, the plot twist that comes on Sunday that you and I know about, but there are people who don't, is so crucial that they hear about it. So really what I want to encourage you to do again today, first of all, take some time and thank the Lord for what he did for you. But then think about those you know who don't understand it, who don't get it. Maybe they go to church, but they don't get it. Maybe they don't go to church. Maybe they've never gone to church. Increasing numbers of people don't, and they don't know the story. This is an opportunity for you to reach out to them and connect with them. We have a whole bunch of these cards that are sitting right next to the door when you go out. These will do no good Sunday morning. These are for you to take with you. And maybe you're going shopping tomorrow. Leave some. Maybe you're going out to dinner. Take it to the wait staff. Maybe you're going to see your family Saturday instead of Sunday. Take this to them. Invite them. Take the chance because this message is that important. Let's celebrate this week, okay? All right. God, thanks for a great service. Thanks for coming out. You're dismissed. Hope to see you Sunday morning. Thanks.